Okay, welcome back once again. I am Mike, bringing to you the final installment of this lecture series. Now, the last couple chapters uh, of this book are pretty straightforward, and they basically just review everything that we've been talking about so far. So I'm not going to cover the last couple chapters. Uh, this next chapter is it's pretty complicated, but extremely influential in linguistic anthropology. So this might be, like I said before, the most famous chapter of the book, and it's called Covert Racist Discourse. So discourse, remember, is talk, text, uh, text with pictures, sometimes even just pictures by themselves. Uh, anything that makes language makes sense. Now she calls this covert racist discourse, uh, but she really means that this is primarily covert to white folks. Uh, racialized populations can sense the racism in this stuff pretty easily. Um, even if we have trouble uh, talking about it in words, a lot of us can sense these things. So I'm going to focus on what she calls mock Spanish. And this is on page 128. So let's read the definition that she gives us. So mock Spanish is a set of tactics that, that speakers of American English use to appropriate symbolic resources from Spanish. Some of the Spanish loan words she talks about here are words like macho and cerveza and manana or manana or however it might be pronounced in a hyper anglicized way. So really quick, I'm sure many of us have said these phrases uh, and don't feel them as racist. We don't even think twice about it. Here's an example. Imagine you're a white person and says, let's do this work manana and go have a cerveza. So there's something particularly cringeworthy about uh, this when Spanish speakers hear, hear this, right? It's obviously not a serious attempt at Spanish, hence the mock Spanish aspect. Uh, but let's look deeper. What makes this funny? What makes this sentence make sense and just not two random, randomly chosen Spanish words? It works because it draws on stereotypes about a lazy Mexican. So what this really might say underneath is something like, let's procrastinate by drinking beer like a lazy Mexican and just do our work tomorrow. Some of you might immediately say, no way, that's not what I mean at all did not mean that i believe you but what language ideology are you using to protect yourself in this moment what ideology is this personalist ideology which holds that your intentions are more important than the feelings of the next person um or you might say but the word manana just means tomorrow, and the word cerveza just means beer. So what's the problem? What ideology are you using now to protect yourself? This is the one that refers to definitions, refers to definitions, to reference books. Referentialist ideology. You got it. So. Now we're gonna add another concept to this discussion, indexicality. This is on uh, the pages 142 through 144. This is a tough concept. So let's break it down. Uh, I'm gonna put it in terms, in the easiest terms possible. And if you don't get it immediately, that's fine. It's okay. This is complicated shit. So first, what's an index? This is how you can remember what an index is. Like our index finger, 
it points. It points to something. An index. Index finger. According to this theory of language, uh, language in general is indexical in two major complicated ways. You ready? Language indexes, that is, language points backward and language points forward. So it's a double directional pointing, a pointing backward and a pointing forward at the same time. Let's break that down. Let's talk about backward first. So we just spoke about the line, let's do this work tomorrow and go have a survey. Team. So pointing backward points back, or back, the camera reverses me points back at previous context, previous knowledge. That's what makes this language funny. That's what makes it make sense uh, because it's pointing back at stuff that we know. It draws upon stereotypes of Mexicans that we happen to know about. That is presupposed knowledge. That's the pointing backward at different contexts, pointing backward at the knowledge we already know. We presuppose all of this deeply ingrained stuff in the words that we use. And that makes it make sense. So that's deep. Now compare this to the referentialist ideology. The one that says the word manana means tomorrow. That's the definition. But the definition is not what makes something like this funny. And we don't walk around with dictionaries to make stuff make sense. Instead, our words are always pointing backward at previous contexts. Always. Always. A referentialist ideology, however, pretends that the only context that is needed to make sense uh, are the definitions. Definitions without history. But the definition is not what makes this funny. It's not how this phrase is interpreted as humorous. Okay, so now let's look at the other side. The other uh, aspect of indexicality. So we just talked about pointing backward to context. Okay, I'm just going to stop pointing. But how about pointing forward? The pointing forward aspect is the creative effect language has in and on the context in that very moment. So maybe the creative effect of saying manana and cerveza, in the moment, it makes people laugh. The language has a direct effect on the reality. It performed an action in the context. What are some other creative effects? Because we're looking forward now, so it's going to create effects in a forward direction. How about now people recognize you as an easygoing jokester and you're likable. This is a stance you're taking. I'm cool. I'm likable. Jane Hill goes further and says that this creates an image of you as a cosmopolitan, right? Maybe even a Spanish speaker. Maybe educated in some Spanish because you travel a lot and you need to be able to speak uh, a minimal amount of Spanish because you're really cool. All this points into the future of the conversation as it's happening in real time. This is the effects that you're having on the context that people will then react to. But let's zoom out. Let's zoom out into a larger societal context. While you have created yourself as a likable, cool cosmopolitan, you have just spread a stereotype about Mexicans. Your words have accidentally 
indexed stereotype. The pointing backward at presupposed knowledge. While at the same time, you have put these stereotypes into circulation, the pointing forward into the future, you have extended the social life of the stereotype into the present and into the future. Now let's say one of your friend laughs and says, hey, that is funny, I am gonna say that from now on. So that extends the social life into the future that hasn't happened yet. Now remember, you don't intend to do all of these things, but, it, but that is not what is important in racist language. Personalist ideology doesn't matter. In fact, you could have no idea that these stereotypes even exist. Nevertheless, you are implicated in extending your social life. You have had creative effects on the world. You've had creative effects, not just on the conversation, but in American society, in and on American society, in general, but pointing forward into the future. So this is the double pointing arrow of indexicality, backward and forward. Backward to previous context, forward into context while it happens and into the future. So in Michael Silverstein language, this is presupposition and entailment. They happen together. They happen simultaneously, always. Indexicality has the potential to point to all kinds of stuff at the same time. But treating language through the referentialist ideology pretty much freezes language in place. This means that there is no reference to the past. There's no pointing backward at previous contexts or uses. There's only the pointing to the definition of the word. Uh, in a similar way, baptismal ideology also freezes language. It says there is one past definition that is the correct one. This word has the exact same meaning as the way it was in the past. Covert racist discourse works through indexicality by indirectly pointing to racist meanings. Not directly, just indirectly. This provides cover for a lot of racist speech because it only points indirectly. And people can say, that's not what I meant. And basically there is no way to prove whether or not they meant that. The personalist ideology can protect a whole lot of racist speech. And racism like this is only indirectly indexed. Now here's the thing. People do not speak like KKK members. They don't speak like white supremacists anymore. And here's the most important point. Most racist speech today works through indirect index account. Most of it. Most of it works through this complicated mess of language ideologies and index account. And we still haven't figured out what to do about it. This is why we need people to help point this stuff out, especially white people. If you are watching this, we need your help most of all. And it's not about being politically correct. It's simply and only about being a good human being. That's it. Okay, so I am Mike once again. And that was absolutely pleasurable. One of my favorite books of all times. I hope that 
everybody out there will read this book. Um, it will give you some great insight into what racist speech is and what it looks like now, today, in 2018. So I'm Mike. I will see you guys around for the next video series of whatever I choose to give you a video series on. See you around.